So welcome to um, my session at Bry Forum, guys. Um, it's been uh, my, my pleasure to present at uh, Bry Forum for, for three years now. I've uh, probably done about sort of 10 or 11 sessions over the last three years in combination between uh, London and, um, and Chicago. How many people here is it their first Bry Forum ever? Wow, kind of a lot. I hope you're enjoying it so far. You're getting a lot out of the sessions. Um, it just carries on the same way, just as good. Um, I hope you go and visit the sponsors, by the way, because they paid for it. So it's really important that everybody goes and at least uh, talks to a few sponsors and, and helps them get their, uh, get their money's worth. So <clears throat> um, my name's Jim Moyle. Uh, as you can tell from the accent, I come from London, England. I hope that uh, that's not going to prove a problem to you guys. Um, I'm a CTP, a recent CTP, and I'm the uh, lead solutions consultant for Atlantis Computing. So my session today is cool statistics tricks to make you look like a hero. And <clears throat> a lot of this has come out of my work for um, Atlantis Computing because I needed to find out some ways to do some some, some things a little, little bit better. Now, when I say hero, I may have been exaggerating slightly. Really what I mean is there's some stuff here that might make you a little bit better at your job. Stuff here that might make your job a little bit easier. And make you stand out from the, from the rest of the crowd. Now, we collect a huge amount of data in IT, or we can collect a huge amount of data in IT. And it occurred to me about a year ago that we don't do anything with it. We collect all of this data, and we do nothing intelligent with it. And that seems to me to be a huge waste of stuff we could do much, much better. So I spent a reasonable amount of time looking into various techniques and tools we can use to try and take advantage of that data. And it's all about statistics. And some of these statistics tools um, are nice and easy. And I wanted to make them so, so hopefully everybody can use them and everybody can use them nice and easily. So you've probably heard the phrase, you can lie about anything with statistics. Well, maybe if you use it wrong, you can do. Or you're deliberately um, misleading you can do. Statistics is just applied probability theory. And probability theory is, well, if we throw two dice, we know how often we're going to get a double one, we know how often we're going to get a seven. And statistics is just applying that knowledge to other data. So it's all based on probability theory. So it's not magic, it's not anything else, it's just the roll of the dice, as it were. So. At the moment, what we do when we're looking at data, or when we're looking at our systems, when we're looking at our environment, is if we need to size something, if we need to expand something, or if we're going to do a VDI project or a Zenap project, we need to size our environment, then we can go and collect some data. But what tends to happen is we tend to do this. We tend to have a gut feeling as to where things should be. Now, you can say that, well, my gut feeling is quite good because I've got years of experience. I've done 20 of these projects, and actually, I kind of trust my gut. But when you're sitting in a meeting with a CIO, saying I've got a gut feeling isn't really appropriate, I don't think. It's very hard to defend. So what, what I'm going to try and help you do is try and give you some tools which stop you saying, it's because I'm me that this is OK you can actually come back and rely on some maths and some proof. And it means that instead of having that big argument as to why I'm right and they're not, because the storage guy doesn't think you're right, you know, because the virtualization guy says, no, you can get away with less or you need more. So it's trying to give you tools to be able to stand behind what you're saying and be able to avoid all these kind of arguments. So <clears throat> the last time people just relied on gut feeling was back in the 15th century. 
So really, what you're standing there saying, I'm relying on my gut feeling, is that I'm still in the 15th century. It doesn't matter if you've got a data center around you, you're still there. Because statistics started, and probability started with this guy. This guy was called Girolamo Cardano. And he was a bit of a wasteful. He was not a nice man. Um, he invented it, probability theory, to gain an advantage at playing um, games of chance, playing cards, so he wanted to take somebody else's money. And his book on probability theory was published in 1663 when he was almost dead, so he made sure nobody else knew about it. And to show you what kind of character was, there was actually a chapter in there on literally cheating, on how to hide cards up your sleeve and stuff. So you'll find that there are two things when you're looking at statistics that come up again and again. One is gambling or chance and trying to make sense of what people call chance and, and trying to try and interpret patterns from that. And <clears throat> the other one is astronomy. When um, statistics first came out of the realm of card games, was when somebody predicted uh, when Ceres would appear from uh, the, the glare of the sun correctly, from what everybody in the rest of the world said that was too little data. Ceres, the dwarf planet in our solar system. And those are the two areas where statistics have been most consistently used. Um, I'd like to see a lot more of it in IT. I'd like to see um, a, lot, a lot more use of it by you guys and by, by everybody else as well. <clears throat> but if you look in any of the stats books, you don't see IT mentioned anywhere. Nobody does it. But being able to prove that you're right is really important. So Florence Nightingale did it. I mean, we all remember as the, the Lady of the Lamp. Well, that's not really why she's famous. Well, that's what we remember her for. She felt such guilt about all the, the lads dying in the Crimean War and not being able to help her, help them that she started a, a letter writing campaign. And she started gathering evidence about illness in hospitals. And she managed by statistics to prove that washing your hands before treating patients was a good idea. And the one thing that she said at the end of it when she fought against the, the patriarchy at the time was that it doesn't matter what opinions anybody else has. If you have the truth, you can stand behind it. So, it can be very persuasive, and it can, can be persuasive in the way that you guys don't have to do anything. You can just leave it there and stand back and say, you can work it out for yourselves. It's easy enough. You know what I said? It was all probability. So it's, it's um, yes, probability theory. So generally, you can say that the, the rule is that <clears throat> if this set happens then there is a 0.5% chance, sorry, 0.05 chance that it's down to uh, randomness. So really, that's saying one in 20, we could be wrong. Um, one in 20 prescriptions are wrong. That's probably too much of an error factor, right? One in 20 prescriptions either have the wrong dosage or the wrong length of time or even the wrong drug on them. So one in 20 is not accurate enough for some occasions. There are other occasions where it's even more important not to be wrong. For instance, getting your partner's name right. <laughs> I don't want a 19 out of 20 error rate here, right? <laughs> so how you use this stuff is very dependent on how important it is and how often you repeat it, right? Because going back to the, the, the roll of the dice, if you roll it once, you can't say, because it landed on a five, that dice rolling always ends up landing on five. You need to be able to repeat these tests. And the more important it is, the more you should repeat them. So that that one in 20 thing doesn't catch you out. So the stuff I'm gonna give you, don't just take some data and run it once. Do it several times, and then you won't get caught out by the, by the one in 20. And if it's gonna cost you millions of pounds, like buying a sand for VDA, Really important to run this test a couple of times, yeah? So, <clears throat> because I couldn't find anything out about um, VDI 
or terminal server or desktop virtualization and statistics. I couldn't find any blog posts. I couldn't find any documentation. I was kind of at a bit of a loss. I, I started opening up statistics box, box, you know, statistics for dummies and trying to read it through it and trying to get some useful stuff. But I just got really confused. And trying to teach yourself statistics in a weekend is not the best plan. Um, <clears throat> so I managed to have a, a friend at, um, at Queen Mary University put me in touch with their statistics department. And they were kind enough to give me some of their time. And they were kind enough um, to let me have um, a day with one of their statistics professors, um, a guy called Jonathan Beswick. And we initially had some pretty bad communication problems because I was sort of talking about performance monitor. And he would look at me with this glazed look in his eye going, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then he would try and talk to me about something very basic in statistics. And I would get the exact same look in my eye, looking in back, going, I have no idea what you're talking about. So it took us a while to sort of discover a common argo as to what, what I needed and, and what he could provide. Um, but once we'd sort of established that, some really cool stuff came out of it. Um, we have a strange problem in IT. He said that statistics, a lot of the time, is, is developed for making connections and making patterns out of very small amounts of data. What we have is the opposite problem. We have too much data. It's overwhelming. So <clears throat> that area of statistics is actually quite new. And the other area of, um, that too much data applies to is actually um, stock trading. And we'll go on to that in, in a second. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to be able to take a CSV from any part of your infrastructure, right? So a perf1 CSV, something from your switch. Everybody can create a performance a comma separated value from almost every bit of their infrastructure. And I wanted to be able to use Excel to um, process this. I didn't want to say to you guys, actually, what you should do is go out and buy a really expensive stats program. No, not at all. Because everybody's got a copy of your Excel. Everybody can get a CSV. So let's combine the two and see what, see what useful stuff we can get out of it. Um, I spoke again to my friend at the university about what I was planning to do. And she said, I thought this was worth writing down, doing statistics in Excel means that you'll spend more time in reconstructive surgery after you've punched yourself in the face in frustration than the time spent buying a proper stats program. So given that, we're still going to try and do it. <laughs> um, but if you want to get fairly deep into it, then perhaps a proper stats program is appropriate, because there are some weirdnesses about Excel. Before we really get into it, um, <clears throat> I want to give you um, a bit of a warning. And the warning is about what people call a bell curve. See what I did there? about the bell curve, because, or what people call a normal distribution. Everybody's heard of the normal distribution, right? Yeah? At least heard of it? So the normal distribution is a special way of describing data. And it's called a normal distribution because it's the one people normally use. It's the default. And a lot of stuff that you read about uses, uses this. Now, that's a big mistake in IT because our data is generally not normally distributed. You can do things to it to make it so, but as it comes out in your CSV, it's generally not normally distribu distributed. It's very, very special kind of data. So be very careful about falling into traps of applying the wrong kind of tools. There's an extreme example of using this in the wrong way. Um, there is an equation called the Black-Scholes equation, which um, the guy, Mr. Black and Mr. Scholes, won the uh, Nobel Prize for. And it was used in um, derivative trading. And <clears throat> the assumption of that equation is that it's a normal distribution. It turns out the stock market is not a normal distribution. And that assumption and the use of that equation, because of the assumption, was what caused derivative trading to go out um, to go mental and essentially cause the credit crunch. So don't use it the wrong way. Otherwise, we'll all be like Greece. OK? Is that a European joke? Does everybody understand that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Just to prove, I'm not going to, I'm not, by the way, before, that was the last picture I'll show you of a dead guy, and this is the last picture I'll show you of an equation, right? <laughs> but that's just to prove to you that the normal distribution is specific. It doesn't just mean, oh, my data looks big in the middle and small at the sides. <clears throat> so be very careful. In one of the books I read, it said that um, statistics is not just a set of tools. It's a whole subject. To use it properly, you need to understand the whole subject. Um, bollocks. <laughs> as long as you know the right assumptions for the right equations, you can use some of these tools and you can use them properly in your environment. So I'm going to give you some tools that you can use in your environment. So if anybody says you need to understand it all, rubbish. <clears throat> um, as I say, I work for Atlantis Computing, and we do um, storage optimization for desktop virtualization. So most of my data that I gather is IOPS and from I.O. So don't get confused when all of my data is about, um, is about I.O., because that's just the data I have, because it's where I work. Um, these are also applicable to networking, CPU, memory, whatever you've got that you can take measurements of. So don't worry, it's all I.O. It's just because of where I work. So, <clears throat> um, performance counters. We all know how to run Perfon, or at least I hope we do. Um, if you want to actually get proper CSV data, then you would need to run your data collection set within Perfon, and you can do a single local or a single remote machine. Or really, what you want to be doing is you can use WMI. And if you go to um, is it Technic Scripts, yeah, Technic Scripts Center, there's loads of really good scripts that you can use to collect WMI performance information from a lot of machines in your, a lot of Microsoft machines, your servers, your desktops in your environment. So if you do need, want to start getting um, this data, then get some of those scripts run against WMI and start collecting all this, all this in uh, CSV format. The trouble is, is once you get that, you end up with something like this. <clears throat> I can't make any sense of that, even with the key for all the lines. I have no idea what that means. Um, I tried to count how many Perfon calendars there were in a, in a Windows client OS. I very quickly realized this was a futile exercise. So my best bet is about 16,000. If you collect everything you will, and then put, import your CSV into Excel, you will end up with about 16,000 different columns. Don't quote me on that. That was a guess. Even your battery, right? Your battery's got five counters. You've got remaining capacity, charge rate, discharge rate, voltage, and whatever tag is. Don't know what tag means. I don't even know what's a good charge rate or a discharge rate. And this is a problem with a lot of these counters, right? Is that it can be four or a thousand. You can look at it as, well, I don't know. It's four or a thousand bad. Are we allowed to have it peaking up like that? I don't know. Although this isn't particularly stats, I just wanted to in, um, include this bit, bit of software um, for you. PAL, Performance Analysis Log Files. Great, great little bit of software. It's a bit of open source software that um, somebody at Microsoft wrote in a weekend. And <clears throat> this bit of data is, um, I was doing a, a reference architecture with Cisco, Citrix, and Atlantis um, on Hyper-V. And this is a Hyper-V write latency performance counter that I was drawing out. And I put my performance metrics into PAL, and you can see that it gives you those limits. So it's all automatically in there. So between 15 and 25 uh, milliseconds latency is warning, and above 25 milliseconds latency on write is, is critical. So if you feed your Perfmon logs into this software, it will kick you out lovely graphs like this, and it will tell you whether you're in trouble on those counters or not. It will also give you your um, average, your mean, and your max your trend, and 
We'll get onto this in a bit, your standard deviation for your data. Really good stuff. <clears throat> One of the things that I was always taught when I was just starting out doing my NT4 MCSE many moons ago, um, you should always take a baseline of your data. Um, how many people have a baseline of their environment, a performance baseline of their environment? One, two, two, three, maybe. <coughs> yeah, almost nobody does. Um, and I don't trust them anyway, because it will always be caveated. Make sure your environment is normal when you take your baseline. Well, if I knew just by looking whether it was normal or not, I wouldn't need a baseline. And I've got 16,000 counters in one Microsoft OS. How do I know which ones to take and which ones are going to be relevant in the future? If I knew which ones are going to be relevant in the future, I'd be doing a lottery. I wouldn't be taking baselines. So in a large extent, I think baselines are a bit of a waste of time. And anyway, most people don't have them. So nothing is going to be dependent on baselines. Because when you're in trouble, and when you say, I've got a performance issue, or my CIO is wanting to know how much money I need to spend on this bit of kit for sizing, I don't want somebody to ask me, well, where's your baseline? Why haven't you taken one? Rubbish. So no baselines. So <clears throat> say you've collected your data. You've, got, you've used WMI. And this is um, a graph of um, a thousand user environment, thousand concurrent user environment. It's local government, and um, it's their I/O consumption over a, a working day. So this is just transfers per sec accessed by. Um, well, it's actually um, friends of mine at Centrix who gave me this data. Hence why I've got their logo up there. I promised them I would. So <clears throat> we've got this from physical machines now. You can just as e equally have your CPU data, your network data, your memory. And we have a problem here. So let's have a line. Now, <clears throat> we've got peak. So our peak value is almost 50,000 IOPS for our, for our concurrent users. Now, I hope it's obvious to everybody that we can't size for peak, because all the people on the uh, top left-hand corner, there's no data there. There's nothing there. So it's going to be a massive waste of money if we size for peak. So what a lot of people do is they size for average. An average of this data is 6,000 IOPS. And that's over the working day. Over a 24-hour period, it goes down to 4,000 IOPS. And over the week, when you've got the weekend, when there's nobody doing anything, it goes down to 3,000 IOPS. And if we set our limit there, we can see that we're not covering this area of people's working day. Now, <clears throat> I'm not really bothered about that whole area. What I'm really bothered about is this bit right here. Because this is my busiest part of my busiest day. It's when my system is under the most load, when there's the most users on, when it's going to impact the most people. And there's something really interesting about this part of the day. Because if you look there, we don't have a single data point below the mean. And it means that when it counts the most, 100% of your users are going to be having a, um, a worse experience than they're used to on physical. And you can imagine the consequences that that's going to have on your, on your help desk. This goes for any resource. It's not just I.O. I must, must say that it's not just I.O., right? It's everything else as well. This, is, this bit here is why I think sizing for mean is terrible. Because when it really counts, you're at your worst point. Mathematically, you're guaranteed to be at least 50% of the time having a worse experience. 
Yeah. So, if we know that sizing for peak is stupid, because we spend too much money, and we just identified that sizing for average is probably not your best idea either. Lots of people say sizing for average, everything evens out, right? Because you know somebody has a peak when somebody else has a dip, and it all evens out. It's not true, because you get that sort of graph for everything. So no sizing for peak, no sizing for average. So what we need to do is we need to find somewhere in that gap where to stick our line, where to size, and this, in this case, it would be storage. And we can either go with our 15th century gut feeling, or we can use something a bit cleverer. And we use something that's based on standard deviation. We'll talk about standard deviation in a sec. And it's something called Chebyshev's inequality. Oop, my line, there we go. Now, don't worry about the name, but it gives us a mathematical way to place our line. It means that, remember statistics are all based on probability, right? So it means that we can say that at least 84% of the time, our users are going to have as good as or better than desktop experience. Guaranteed. Now, that's quite a nice thing to be able to say, I think. If you can apply that kind of thinking to CPU, network, I/O, when you're sizing your VDI or your Zen app or really anything, right? Because this is just applies to anything at all. Gives you a number to stand behind, and it's very easy to work out as well. There's more data, um, this time from Lakeside. So thank you to them for providing it. And the same line comes in there. That's a bit more obvious that that, that um, would come in, but. It at least gives you a number to, um, to uh, stand behind. <coughs> so standard deviation, again, it's just probability. It's how likely a data point is to be close to your mean. If you're very far away from your mean, that's an unlikely event. If you're close to your mean, that's a likely event. It's just a measure of how spread out your data is. And standard deviation crops up everywhere. It works in most of the software. It is the basis behind um, ESX clustering and load balancing. That's all based on standard deviation and how things are swapped around. If, not, if you haven't read that book, by the way, it's, it's amazing. Go and read it if you're at all interested in, uh, in uh, clustering or HA. So, This is an online calculator for Chebyshev's inequality, for that uh, weight size that I gave you before. And <clears throat> one thing to notice is you see at the top, it's from a, a stock option and trading site, is this calculator. And you tend to find that too much data comes from a lot of the, um, the statistics for too much data comes from these stock and, and trading, uh, trading books or trading sites. And <clears throat> this is difficult to do, but uh, let's. So on this, if I change that, so that's mean plus 1.25 standard deviations gives us 36% guarantee. Mean plus 2.5 standard deviations gives us that 84% guarantee that I was talking about before. So to get this Chebyshev's inequality line, your sizing line, is mean plus 2.5 times standard deviation. Standard deviation is really easy to work out. You just put your CSV into Excel and do STD, DEV, and then your range, and it will give you your standard deviation. Very, very easy. And your mean plus two and our standard deviations will give you an 84% guarantee. The reason why 84% um, is, the, is the one is because <clears throat> you get a law of diminishing returns. The more standard deviations you add, the less you get from it. So the less bang for your buck you get. <clears throat> and this is the graph. If you plot out how many standard deviations you add, how much guarantee it gives you. 
then at 2.5, you can see you're probably about right as bang for your buck. So that's why 2.5 is what um, is the sort of golden number that people go for. And why I definitely advise you guys to say mean plus 2.5 standard deviations. So hopefully we've taken a fairly hard job of sizing from a load of data in a CSV to something you can do in Excel in a couple of minutes, right? And you can stand behind that number. So <clears throat> that is the first little tool. The second one we're going to talk about is correlation. And the first type of correlation you have is um, what they call positive correlation. Um, the more you smoke, the more ill you're going to get. This is particularly opposite to me since I gave up smoking two months ago, so this slide is there to remind me to stop smoking still. So positive correlation, stuff rises and falls together. The other type of correlation is negative correlation. A negative correlation is when one value goes up, another value goes down. So the harder it gets, the less clothes you wear. You're very lucky that I didn't pick a scantily clad woman on a beach for this. <laughs> so we've got positive and negative correlation. Now, you're in for a lovely treat here. We've got a really exciting live Excel demo. <laughs> Which I'm sure you're really happy about, but it's, it is opposite. So, <clears throat> what I've got here is a Perfon trace. All right, 3,600 lines. And what we've got is some CPU metrics and some memory metrics and some disk metrics. So this is the kind of thing that you'd be taking out of a system, I, I would say. And almost 4,000 lines of CSVs doesn't make much sense to people. Now, <clears throat> what I'd like to see in this is how these match up to each other. What events are linked? If you have a performance problem, <coughs> what other stuff in your system, in your environment, in your enterprise, <coughs> is linked to this issue? What you want to do is find some correlation between the different metrics that you have in your environment. If you have a desktop slowdown or an Exchange server slowdown, or you have CPU spikes, and all you, all you can tell is that your resource is getting hammered. You can't tell a root cause. And these are the stuff that's really hard to find out. If you have intermittent performance issues, very, very difficult to root cause. So what you quite like to do is find something else in your environment that has the same, or in fact the exact opposite, effect as your, as your performance issue. So you want to use correlation. If you add the data analysis add-on into, into Excel, um, you do have a correlation function there, but it's not very good at large amounts of data. Um, so I've written a, um, a macro that, uh, that does it for large amounts of data. Um, I'll make that available on my website for anybody to download so they can have the macro. Um, it's www.jimmoyle.com. I'll also give it to Brian to post on, uh, on his um, site, so anybody can have this afterwards. <clears throat> so, what's correlation? So, between between naught and one, naught being not correlated at all, and one being totally positively correlated, and naught and minus one, or naught again. It's not correlated at all. 
and minus 1 is completely negatively correlated. So what we have here, I haven't actually found, a, it's a kind of reflected along the diagonal line. You see that diagonal line of 1s? It's reflected along that. I haven't found a way in my macro to eliminate the top half, but there you go. And we can see <coughs> that when we compare row D to row B, let's get, let's put a key in. So D to B, we can see our percentage interrupt on percentage process of time are correlated quite strongly. So in my color scheme, green is strongly correlated, amber is um, averagely correlated, and red is weakly correlated, and without color, there's no correlation. We've got a minus number there, which is C to B, and we can see that is percent idle time of the processor to percent use. And we can see that, yeah, that, that is logical that those will be negative correlated because one's a measure of how much is free and one's a measure of how much is being used. They're not 100% because there is other states the process can be in, like weight. So they are slightly negatively correlated, and we can tell that. I mean, we know that, we know that anyway, right? But this is independent of whether we know it. So this is to help us tell us stuff that we don't know. We can actually see that on the top left, we've got lots and lots of green. It just so happens that's lots of processor stats. So you could imagine there'll be links between those. And on the bottom right, we got lots of weak or medium correlations, which is all the I.O. So perhaps your read latency is slightly correlated to your write latency. All this stuff is, is useful to know. But <clears throat> That's just an example to show you what the macro is doing and, and how correlation works. Let's have something a bit more useful. So again, we have a, um, a perform um, counter set. And <clears throat> this is to detect what's causing a processor spike. So I've artificially caused a processor spike by using a, a utility. And I've taken perf one of all the processes CPU activity, which is something that, that we could do. And we can see here that these rows are my processors. One, two, three, four. The total, and then that, which is, the, the div zero is because you divide by zero in the macro, and I haven't hidden those yet. But we can see that there is one process there that is strongly correlated. So I can tell you, without even looking at the system, without examining it, without examining what software is installed, I can tell you that that process, which is G, is the one causing my issue, All right? And that process is one called factorial. Let me just get the... Uh, and that is the tool that our own Tim Mangan wrote. And he wrote that to um, maximize out your CPU. So that's an interesting way to troubleshoot because all it does is tell you links, yeah, between two different metrics. And then you look at the links and you, you use your brain to say, right, well, this is caused by that. So smoking and increase of disease or death is correlated. But death doesn't cause smoking, smoking causes death. So you need to make sure that you don't confuse correlation with causality. So once you've got your correlation, you have a look and say, well, my CPU resource being taken up is, a, is an endpoint. 
And it's probably a process, so let's have a look in processes and see which one's correlated. Which one's correlated to taking memory? And because it doesn't have to be from one machine, right? So you can take your stats from your desktops and your stats from your network, and you can see what people are doing or what applications are causing your network to be flooded or causing your storage to be overloaded. So for those times when you're looking at an intermittent performance problem, this is a really, really useful tool to give you some direction to go in. Because I've done it before. I've been on site. We've got an intermittent performance issue, and your heart just sinks. Your stomach sinks. Oh, no. A user phones up. You run down to their desk. Show me. No, it's better now. <laughs> no, it's all right today. And then you go off site, and you guaranteed be half an hour into your car, and somebody, no, no, it's, it's, it's rubbish again. <laughs> well, I don't like that. I also don't like looking stupid on site, saying, I don't know, I can't find it. I can't find the answer. So I tend to use correlation. There is other things that you can use for this sort of thing, and I don't want to diss any of these people, because this is stuff that is designed so that you can use with just a CSV and a copy of Excel. If you want to look deeper into your um, environment, then some of these people are out there, some of them aren't. But go talk to Lakeside or Centrix or Liquor Labs or Splunk or EG Innovations and there's others as well, but those are, are some of the main ones. They'll be able to give you a lot more intelligence around your, um, your environment. But you don't always have those um, in your environment. You don't always have the money to go out and buy those. So what I wanted to do was give you something you could just use by yourself. Um, <clears throat> so what we've we got, we've got Chebyshev's Shevs inequality for sizing. We've got some correlation for troubleshooting. And this is the last one. Now, I failed on this one. I wanted to do some um, pattern analysis. And for the life of me, I couldn't get it to work in Excel. Couldn't do it. But I decided it was important enough to tell you about it anyway, despite the fact that it broke my rules. So pattern analysis will tell you about this kind of thing, whether you have a repeating pattern or if you have clusters of, of, um, of, of events. <clears throat> and these are things that you, um, you should know about in your environment if you've got big peaks happening on a regular basis. So this is, a, this is every 15 minutes I've got, a, I've got a really big peak and I happen to know in one of my systems that this is measuring that I've got a flush time of 15 minutes. So I need to know, I know I need to go and um, adjust that. Um, <clears throat> How much time have I got left, by the way? 30 minutes. I think we've got to get out a little early, but that's okay. <laughs> Not quite yet. So, I know that I've got a, um, a flush time of 15 minutes, my sister, so I'm going to go and have a look at that. <clears throat> there are some free tools to help you with pattern analysis. Um, one is an open source statistical tool called R. That's it, just called R, um, which makes them really hard to search for. That will do all kinds of cool stuff for you. It's a bit, it's open source, so it's a bit kind of rough and ready, but it will do a lot of stuff and it is free. Um, specifically for pattern analysis, I'd read something from anything from this guy, Bolkowski. He also does a, um, a free, it's basically a VB script that will take CSVs and, and, will, and will try and identify patterns in your CSVs. Um, it's a bit of a crappy little app. It only runs on 32-bit windows and um, <clears throat> It's called Patterns, P-A-T-T-E-R-N-Z. 
So patterns with a, with a Z instead of an S. So have a look at that. And that will start to give you the kind of um, pattern intelligence from your data that can show you, show you regular, um, regular events happening. On the other hand, there is a problem with patterns. And the problem is especially acute with patterns. In that, actually, it's, just, it's the same, same with all, all the stuff that I've shown you, um, but it's especially true with patterns, is that just because you've run the tool doesn't mean it's not there, right? It will show you something is there, but it's not definitive. You can't run correlation against some of your stats and say there's definitely no correlation there. It will tell you whether something is there, but don't take it as definitely not. And the same thing with patterns. You need to rely on your eye and your brain as well for patterns especially. And the human brain is perfectly set up to do pattern analysis as long as it's not given too much data at the same time. So make sure that I couldn't put an eye up there without putting that eye up there. <laughs> so make, make sure when you do patterns, you use your eye. Um, this is all 708. See, you know I said it, it, a lot of it goes back to astronomy. So it's betting, and let's include the stock market in this, and astronomy. All 786 known planets to scale. Now, <clears throat> planets are turning out to be so common that sure, all the planets in the galaxy of this chart would have to be nested in itself, with each planet replaced by a copy of the chart at least three levels deep. We're not relying totally on computers to find these planets. How you find them is as a planet passes in front of a star, that star's radiance decreases. And that change in radiance of the star indicates to you the size and the orbit of a planet. Now this is um, data from the Hubble telescope. I think it's very cool. I put this in because I think it's amazingly cool, but I'm a complete geek, so that's fine if you don't think it's quite as cool, but it is. <coughs> so, <coughs> A lot of these planets have not been found by this pattern analysis software. There's a massive crowdsourcing thing going on at the moment. This is the brightness of a star. You know I said this can apply to any kind of data. Yeah? It doesn't, doesn't have to be I.O. or astronomy. It can be anything. And this is the brightness of a star. And we can see that it varies up and down. And once you get used to looking at these, you can tell the patterns. Because there is four passes of the planet in front of a star as the, um, <clears throat> as the brightness decreases. So we can tell where the planets are in the, in the galaxy. This is human eye because the software misses it. So be careful about pattern analysis, especially, because even the best computers in the world, the best scientists working up the Hubble telescope still rely on people to find the patterns. Do it through a pattern analyzer, and if something's obvious, it'll jump out at you. But just bear in mind, it may, may, doesn't mean that there's nothing there. If you want to have a look at that, by the way, it's planethunters.org, and you can find one and maybe get a planet called after yourself. And if that isn't a bonus for Bry Forum system, I don't know what is. And guys, I knew we were going to finish a, a little early once I got that timing, so um, I apologize for that. I could have maybe done some more, um, more Excel demos or something like that. I bet everybody likes more Excel demos. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so those are the three tools that I hope that you didn't already know about for sizing, for troubleshooting, and for analysis of your general um, environment. So I hope it's something new, and I hope it's something you can use in the future, guys. So thank you very much for coming along.